given before we're suddenly at the appointed time and for the reason that he is uh, and the, a very true sense of the word a guru um, I don't think he needs much more introduction than that I know his uh, address this morning has been uh, greatly anticipated by many of you so without further ado uh, warm ado, a warm welcome please to Professor Lawrence Lessig. So about 50 years after the American Republic was founded, one of sociology's greatest sociologists roamed through the country to discover what America was about. Alexis de Tocqueville published his account in a book called Democracy in America, and this is how he opened his text. Among the novel objects that attracted my attention during my stay in the United States, nothing struck me more forcibly than the general equality of condition among the people. I readily discovered the prodigious influence that this primary fact exercised on the whole course of society. It gives a peculiar direction to public opinion and a peculiar tenor to the laws. It imparts new maxims to the governing authorities and peculiar habits to the governed. I soon perceived that the influence of this fact extends far beyond the political character and laws of the country and that it has no less an effect on civil society than on the government. It creates opinions. It gives birth to new sentiments, founds novel customs, and modifies whatever it does not produce. The more I advanced in the study of American society, the more I perceived that this equality of condition is the fundamental fact from which all others seem to be derived and the central point at which all my observations constantly terminated. Now, as an, as an American, it's a little bit terrifying if the equality of condition is the important fact about America, because, of course, there is no such equality of condition today. But as you think a little bit more about what Tocqueville was saying, what Tocqueville was obviously not saying was that equality in America meant equality for all. There were slaves. There were women who didn't have the right to vote. There, were, there was rich and poor. The point wasn't about equality in an absolute sense, because there was plenty of inequality. By equality of a condition, Tocqueville spoke relative to the rest of the world. He spoke of an ideal that produced a certain entitlement, the entitlement of citizens to engage in building their society. Here, wealth, status, connections, more than anywhere else in that world, these things didn't matter. The ideal inspired America, the ideal of equality, and that entitlement that equality produces inspired America as well. Now, I sometimes think if we could find a Tocqueville to roam the nets and understand what these tubes really are about, I think we would find someone who would write something very much the same. You'd have to tweak it a little bit. It wouldn't be during the stay in the United States. It'd be time on the net. You'd be talking about the peculiar tenor to the code, that it imparts new maxims to the governed. We talk about the domain of the net and net society producing the equality of condition, and that that equality of condition is the fundamental fact to which all others seem to be derived the equality of condition of those who live on the net. Now again, of course, equality doesn't mean all are equal. There are fast broadband networks and there are slow broadband networks. Does it bother you guys that France actually has better broadband than you? I don't know, I just, <laughs> just asked him. There's plenty of inequality out there, of course, in how people access and use the net. But by equality of condition, this modern Tocqueville would mean relative to the rest of life. There is an ideal here. And that ideal produces in the netizens of this space an entitlement, the entitlement to engage. Here, wealth, status, and connections, more than anywhere else in this society, these do not matter. And this ideal 
has inspired the internet. This entitlement has inspired the internet. This entitlement. So think about some examples. Think in the context of commerce. The network, if it's anything, is a platform. It's an architecture. It's an architecture with consequences. It is an architecture that enables innovation. It enables a certain kind of innovation. But think of the history of innovation in the context of the internet. Netscape, founded by a college student. Hotmail, founded by an Indian immigrant, sold to Microsoft for $400 million. ICQ, the first peer-to-peer uh, -peer network chat structure sold, invented by an Israeli teenager sold to Microsoft for $400 million. Google, by two dropouts from Stanford. YouTube, um, I'm sorry, Napster, by a dropout from Northeastern. YouTube, by two kids just from Stanford. Skype and Kazaa, founded by two uh, students who themselves had just come from Sweden and Denmark to found this new company. Reddit, by a dropout from Stanford. Facebook and Twitter, by two kids. What unites all of these innovators in the original structure of innovation in the internet? They are kids, or dropouts, or non-Americans. <laughs> they are outsiders. Because that's what the architecture invited. It was an architecture that entitled outsiders, and outsiders took what they were entitled to. And that entitlement yielded the change. That is, the change the internet gave commerce. Or think about the context of culture. I've been spending a lot of time talking about the difference between what I think of as read-only culture and read-write culture. So the picture of read-only culture is something like this. It's passive consumption of culture produced and broadcast from somewhere else. Read-write culture is completely familiar in the history of culture. It's people taking up culture and recreating it and remixing it and sharing it with their friends. It's what Sousa romanticized when he spoke of young people together uh, in front of every house in the summer, he would find young people together singing the songs of the day of the old songs. It is a picture of culture which contrasted with the 20th century, which was a read-only century, was the history of culture from the beginning of time. Read, write. Taking culture, recreating it, and sharing it with others. Well, the internet is reviving this read-write culture, moving us from the passive consumption of culture to the kind of culture where we create and share what we create. So my favorite recent example starts with this extraordinary film by John Hughes, 1985, The Breakfast Club. This is what we grew up thinking was the Brat Pack. Someone was inspired by that film and also by this um, song by Phoenix, Listomania. But what would happen if we mixed The Breakfast Club with Listomania? And this is what we got. this, but then people started thinking, why don't we do our own version of this? So here's the Brooklyn version. To be outdone, there was a San Francisco version. And a Boston University version. 
Oops, sorry. And then there are now versions of this, literally hundreds of versions of this spread all across the internet. People take the same idea and recreate it in their local space, evoking that romantic idea of Sousa, the young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs, but they're not getting together in their backyard. They're getting together on this free digital platform and creating and sharing their creativity with people around the world. It is a technology. Not technologies like these, but technology like this that produces a culture, a culture that looks like this. Kids can take and remix this culture from around them, so they do. And kids do, and as they do, they feel like they ought. And as they ought, they then believe they are entitled, and that entitlement changes them and this culture. Or think in the context of politics. Here, the effect of the net is perhaps now most obvious. There are tiny stories to tell. In April, Goldman Sachs announced a huge explosion in uh, uh, bonuses paid out to its executives, and those bonuses were reflected in banks around the world. This led to a certain protest in Holland as a tweet campaign against the Dutch bankers' bonuses exploded on Twitter in Holland, leading the banks in Holland, of course not in America, but in Holland, to give up the bonuses that they had just announced. A political effect brought about by the mere act of people engaging in a Twitter campaign. Or obviously, the more significant story is the story of how information spreads in this region to produce the Arab Spring. It is the internet here that enables this activity of democracy, this en enabled people in this equality of the space feel entitlement, and that entitlement yields the change. In all three of these cases, equality, the equality Tocqueville spoke of, produces this entitlement, and it's that entitlement that produces the thing we look at now as the change of this network. Now, it's our convention, especially at events like this, to be happy about this change. It's the politically correct response to celebrate it, to be cheerleaders for the greatness of the network. And I am, you know, it's a sad fact, but I am cheerleader number one. Other professions have much better cheerleaders than me, but cheerleader number one, celebrating the greatness of this network and everything it can give us. But I think at this moment we need fewer cheerleaders and more truth tellers about this network. For there are hard problems here and lots to worry about in the change that this network has produced. It has produced plenty of bad, however much good it has given us. And we must learn how to keep the good here while killing the bad. And this is the thing we haven't learned, maybe haven't learned yet. Instead, what we as societies do is we see the bads, and then we react. And we have reacted insanely stupidly to the bads we have seen. So for example, think in the context of copyright. This is a network that was designed to enable sharing. The response to that design? Sharing. Some people call it piracy. Other people call it sharing. <laughs> Napster was the birth of this ambiguous activity of sharing. 40 million people within just nine months joined this service to produce the largest library of music in human history. The response? The labels went nuts. This largest library of music uh, in music uh, in human history was the largest example of music piracy in history, they said. And they launched a war, a war which my friend, the late Jack Valenti, former head of the Motion Picture Association of America, called his own, quote, terrorist war, where apparently the terrorists in this war are our children. Now, what many, many people don't remember is midway through this war, Napster made an offer to the network, to the, to the labels. The offer was peace. They said, we'll give you a billion dollars. Just let us live. A billion dollars, and we will pay you for use of music on our networks going forward. Billion dollars, we'll buy peace. The labels refused, with the result that in the short term, they destroyed Napster, but in the longer term, they produced a million other Napsters in its place. With the result, not in a reduction of piracy, it turns out that the 
one thing that we know about internet users is they don't know how to read Supreme Court opinions because that's the place where the United States Supreme Court finally declares that this file sharing is illegal. <laughs> Instead, what it produces in an, is an increase in, quote, criminals, otherwise known as terrorists. <laughs> Now, it's completely obvious this would happen, given the internet. Yet policymaking went on as if there were no internet here. Or think of another example, the WikiLeaks example. Obviously, there was lots of harmful information that was released because of what WikiLeaks released when WikiLeaks released the State Department cables. But it should be recognized here that there was first an offer by WikiLeaks to the government, asking the government to review what they had and what they intended to release and to tell them what really could not be released if the safety of important assets was to be preserved. The government refused. Instead, the government, like the labels in Napster, targeted WikiLeaks to destroy it with rhetoric from our government about traitor. Of course, Julian Assange is not an American, so can't be a traitor. Threatening the death penalty, despite the fact we can't actually kill people for anything less than uh, murder. Our war criminal, a little bit hard to see how there was a war criminal going on here, but that was their charge, and with efforts to disable it by encouraging all the infrastructure companies supporting uh, WikiLeaks to disappear from the scene, bullied away by people like uh, Vice President Biden or Senator Joe Lieberman, with the result that in the short term they might destroy WikiLeaks, but with the longer term producing a million other WikiLeaks in its stead. Some of them are better. OpenLeaks, I think, is a better infrastructure for facilitating this information, but lots of them worse. As The Guardian reported just this week, Hackers, in response to this behavior, are being radicalized and launching extraordinarily powerful new attacks in response to this behavior. Now, again, it's completely obvious this would happen, given the internet. Yet policymaking goes on here as if there were no internet. In both cases, we could be smarter. Assume there is harm here. Assume piracy is harmful, although, of course, there's a little bit of skepticism growing about the real harm from piracy, and this report by the SSRC concludes that media piracy has been called a global scourge, international plague, and nirvana for criminals, but it is probably better described as a global pricing problem. And we can assume that WikiLeaks is harmful, although it's a little bit hard to see the spring that's broken out in the Arab area because of the information entitled and spread by this re uh, release as harmful, but even assuming there's harm here, that's not the point. The question is, how do we respond to the harm? And we begin by acknowledging something here that governments must acknowledge. Here it is. There is an internet. <laughs> I want you to say that. I want you to say that with me. There is an internet. There is an internet, and we have to accept the inevitable given that fact. So in copyright, we have to accept the inevitable of, quote, sharing, and respond by compensating artists differently, as the Green Party in Germany has proposed with their cultural flat rate. Or in the context of leaks, we have to accept the inevitability of not leaks, but data dumps, extraordinary dumps of data that facilitate access to all sorts of information, some of it good, lots of it harmful. But in response, we need to support best practices responsibly, encouraging these sites to engage in their important free speech activity in a way that minimizes the harm. Yet we do neither here. Why? These problems are hard. In the best of cases, the government's going to get it wrong. But too rarely is it the best of cases that explains why the government gets it wrong. Too rarely is a mistake here just a mistake. And it's this that I think we need to understand better. So the number one response I've gotten to coming here to uh, New Zealand as I flung myself from Boston here for less than 48 hours in country was, why the hell would you do that? A little bit hurtful, like, you know. <laughs> I love you guys. Why wouldn't I do that, right? No. Why would I do that? Because as hard it is, as it is for you guys to recognize, there's something really special here. Relative to everywhere else, 
there's something really special. There's a high functioning democracy here. Right? I know you argue and bicker about which party has to be in control, but you need to really recognize some extraordinary fact about your country. This is the democracy that works. Now, by saying that, I don't mean to say that democracy here is utopia, that you don't have problems, you don't make big mistakes, but by saying there's a democracy that works, it's to say you still make mistakes, but these are mistakes that can be fixed more easily in a high-functioning democracy than elsewhere. Mistakes. So, for example, think about broadband policy. Extraordinary review by the Berkman Center, Yochai Bert, uh, Benkler, completed last November. Uh, looks at broadband policies across the world and asks the question, what explains what worked? Why did some countries do so well, France? Other countries do so poorly, the United States. And the answer was, the key here was open access policies. As the report says, our most surprising and significant finding is that open access policies played a core role in high-performing countries. The lowest prices and highest speeds are almost always offered by firms and markets where, in addition to an incumbent telephone company and a cable company, there's also competitors who entered the market and built their presence through the use of open access facilities. Now, New Zealand got this policy wrong at first. 1989, you privatized your telecom companies, but there was no sector-specific regulation here. 2001, they began some sector-specific regulation, but it was tiny, pretty reticent. In 2003, the Commerce Commission explicitly refused to impose unbundling requirements. But recognizing the failure of broadband in New Zealand, in 2006, there was a radical change in government policy forcing functional separation following the model of Britain and resulting, as this report suggests in an extraordinary increase in the capacity of New Zealand relative to where they were before. So New Zealand at the time of the adoption of functional separation was well below the OECD average penetration and well below Italy. Uh, Italy, God. After separation, <laughs> New Zealand's penetration level reached that of the OECD average and passed that of Italy. So it was even better than the United States after this functional separation. Still not great given the greatness of this economy, but still much better than it was. A mistake corrected. The United States also made a pretty fundamental mistake. We started on the right track. In 1996, we adopted a series of regulations for the internet that imposed open access requirement on the most important access to broadband, which was then DSL. But in 2001, after the regime change the Supreme Court gave us in bringing us Bush as the president, there was a reversal in that policy. And the United States adopted the same policy of New Zealand and uh, the idealist ideology that drove New Zealand originally and totally deregulated. No obligation at all. And after nine years, we can see the consequence of that change in policy. The United States going from number one in broadband penetration and speeds to number 28 advertised for download speed. So we had an experiment, right? We had a policy that was much like most of the world, open access policies until 2000. The world continued in open access policies and we diverged fundamentally. New Zealand here was a little bit counter to that. It had the bad policy, but then just after the United States diverged, it adopted the more uh, progressive policy. And the data here shows that we, the United States, were wrong. It was a mistaken policy. It produced worse internet, embarrassingly bad internet. So the US government's response to this mistake? Obama comes in, promises to take second place to no one in supporting open and fast networks, launched the FCC on a study of how best to expand broadband in the United States. They commissioned the Benkler study. Benkler turned in the study. The FCC produced their national broadband plan. In their national broadband plan, they simply ignored what Benkler had found. A single footnote refers to the study they had commissioned, and open access is mentioned nowhere in the report. Why? As it was reported, quote, senior commission staff members have essentially conceded that lobbying pr pressure from the monopolies is so strong, is too strong even to begin exploring open access right now. So New Zealand and the United States make a mistake. 
New Zealand corrects the mistake, the United States ignores the mistake because lobbying pressure is too strong. Now, the world misses how profoundly bad government in the United States is. <laughs> no, the world, not you guys. I'm talking about the world. We are not a high-functioning democracy. The effect of special interest in the United States government is pervasive and corrupting. That was not the intent of the design of our government. The framers of our constitution gave us what they said was a republic. By a republic, they meant a representative democracy. By a representative democracy, as the Federalist Papers described, they meant a democracy dependent upon the people alone. So here was their model. The people, the government depended upon. I do my own graphics. That's pretty cool, right? The way that kind of <laughs> But here's the problem, right? Congress has evolved a different dependency. Not just the people, but a dependency upon the funders. As members of Congress spend between 30 and 70% of their time raising money to get back to Congress and to make it so their party regains control, they develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how whatever they might do will affect their ability to raise money. And they become shape shifters in this process, constantly adjusting their view in light of what they know is necessary to help them raise money. So Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she first went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, always lean to the green. Then to make sure nobody misunderstood her, she said, quote, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> Now, this is a corruption. I don't mean a kind of brown bag quid pro quo corruption or the corruption that our famous Rob Lagojevich was just convicted 17 counts of by engaging in crimes to buy and sell government influence. It's not corruption like that. Nothing so crude. It's not the Gilded Age. It's a dependency corruption. It's a system that's developed the wrong dependency Congressmen who've developed the wrong dependency, not a dependency upon the people, but a dependency upon money. And that yields cynicism in the system. 75% of Americans in a poll we conducted in January said, quote, money buys results in Congress. A little bit more Democrats than Republicans, but I can, I can guarantee you when uh, Democrats controlled Congress, it was a little bit more Republicans than Democrats. Doesn't really matter. The point is most Americans, two thirds to three fourths of Americans believe money buys results in Congress, and that yields a profound lack of trust in the government. The latest poll finds that 11% of Americans have confidence in their Congress. 11%? You put that in some context. There were more people who believed in the British crown at the time of the revolution than who believe in our Congress today. Now we need to re recognize as we look at democracies around the world that this kind of corruption is not everywhere. And in particular, I want to suggest you recognize it's not here. Now, Transparency International has already named you the least corrupt nation in the world. But more importantly, special interests Though you continue to adopt this brain-dead system of funding elections through private contributions, still, special interests here are, relative to other democracies, muted. And the difference in the potential for sensible public policy is huge. It manifests itself not just with broadband. Think about intellectual property. As one of the co-founders of Creative Commons, I'm enormously proud of the work that's been done by Creative Commons here as it's embraced the idea of sharing and spreading information broadly, and as the government has embraced the idea of using Creative Commons to spread government information broadly. And just this week, released a site that enabled government agencies to go through the steps they need to guarantee their material is freely available. And the same thing with the open data movement, which started as a private movement here in New Zealand and now has been embraced by the government in an extraordinary way to guarantee that government data is open and accessible to others. This agenda would be impossibly difficult if the special interest extremists were as powerful as they are in the United States. It's impossibly difficult in the United States, but it can happen here. And this difference also manifests, I want to say, an important potential. Important that you recognize how much what you do affects us or us in the United States. Because against the power of government corrupted, we need balanced 
sensible alternatives. And we need you to re resist our extremism. You did a little in the most recent Copyright Infringing File Sharing Amendment Act of 2011. Not enough. And you must do more if our corruption is not to be exported here. I saw the product of that export at an event in France the end of May, the EG8 conference, where Sarkozy decided he wanted to know what the future of the internet would be. And he engaged in that activity with the same corrupted frame that we understand in the United States again and again. He gathered the richest, most powerful companies from the internet together in Paris and said to them, what's the future going to be? Not even recognizing the future was not there in Paris. The present was there. And what the richest of the present do is they protect themselves against the future. To protect the future, Sarkozy, you need to protect what Tocqueville taught us. You need to protect the equality that produces the sense of entitlement and insight and freedom that the internet has given us. And to resolve the inevitable policy problems, we have to churn those problems through democracies that are not corrupt. Help us. Teach us. Shame us to become something more. But until we do, protect yourself from us. Thank you very much. Now, you're going to be taking part in some panel discussions uh, later, so there will be a chance to put questions to you, and I'm just uh, uh, thinking we do in fact have time now. We've got 10 minutes now for some questions on that address. We have some roaming microphones. Are they ready to go? So I will moderate that. Put your hand up, and a microphone will come to you. Uh, make sure it's turned on uh, before you ask the question. <laughs> Isn't it nice to have someone talk about your country in positive terms? In your opinion, what can we do to keep our governments accountable when they engage in uh, activities like you know, secret deals with, you know, with the gossip actor? Like we voters and, and we ran against this, but they seem to be largely, you know, they, they're turning their ear towards what we're saying and carrying on uh, mm -hmm. engaging in, 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 you know, in dirty tricks like, you know, like, like Kylo. Yeah, so um, I think you need, we need to recognize how inc incredibly <coughs> difficult this trade off is for the government. You know, the government sits down and looks at a trading partner, the United States, the most important trading partner they have who says, you're going to agree to the following things if you're going to have trade with us. Then they do the numbers, and it turns out the things they have to agree to cost them less than the benefit they get from the trading. So they agree to them. Australia did that years ago. This issue was presented to Australia. Australia thought that these copyright things were ridiculous, but they thought, OK, ridiculous, what can we do? That's the terms on which we can trade with the United States. Obviously, trading with the United States is extremely important. So I don't, I don't question that it's hard to do the right thing here. And you know, trade is essential, especially for the poor in an economy. So it's essential to make the economy flourish. But I think that there's an obligation that goes with cheating. <laughs> you know, if you cheat, <laughs> you have to, on the other hand, uh, pen make penance for it. And what does penance here mean? It means getting together with other like-minded, rational 
sensible democracies and beginning to articulate clearly and firmly why this extremism makes no sense. And to begin to join with, for example, the developing nations in, in, the, um, in the white belt context who are increasingly pushing a much more balanced, sensible IP regime. And to make it clear to the world that when you talk about balance in the context of intellectual property, you're not saying abolish copyright. I have friends, of course, you can read them on the Twitter stream, I guarantee you after this talk, we'll talk about how I am outrageous because I am still not a copyright abolitionist. I am not an abolitionist. I believe in copyright. It's an essential part of the creative industries and the creative culture. I believe in that. But it is a crazy system right now, and it needs to be reformed. And we need to have sensible policymakers who push for that reform so that we can isolate the extremists on both sides. The IP extremists of Hollywood and the copyright abolitionists too. Both of them are motivated for good reasons, I believe, but both of them are wrong. And we need to find sensible positions and push it. And that's the duty of a country that is forced to sign an agreement that they believe is wrong. Sign the agreement, do good to your people, but start pushing hard so that we get away from this craziness in the future. More questions? We've got time for some more. I'm a law professor, so I do cold calling too. Um, <laughs> um, just put your hand up, a microphone will come to you. Oh. I've got a question for you. Here's a question. Oh, Have you, um, I already said, saw back in two, two early conferences this week. Um, thank you, Tor. I guess my question is, you talked about in the beginning about outside equals necessary for innovation. But to be an outsider, you have to, you have to weigh against something. So, um, like major labels, uh, Dodge governments and so on, necessary for kind of innovation that we enjoy in this day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I used to do a lot of work in the, about uh, post-Soviet countries, and the thing I loved the most about the post-Soviet um, uh, poets was their depression, because they said, you know, when we lived in the Soviet Union, we could be creative, because we had all these rules that we had. But now we live in a world of freedom, and how can you be creative in a world of freedom, where you can say whatever you want? Um, I, you know, maybe there's some kinds of creativity that requires the man on the other side, but not all, you know. These guys who built, you know, Netscape or Twitter or Facebook or uh, Google, they just had a great idea. And the critical freedom that they had was that they didn't have to convince anybody else that their idea was great before they were allowed to deploy it. And then we, users of the net, could agree, this is a great idea, and we adopted it. Because if they had to convince, you know, the owners of AT&T's networks or Comcast networks or Microsoft before they deployed this technology, they never would have gotten out of the door. That's the essential freedom. Not so much that you know, you're motivated to try to kill somebody on the other side. Sometimes, not so interesting. It's more, I have a great idea, I want to get it out there and allow people to use it. And it's that sense of outsider that I think is critical. Yes? Christian Lawrence, is access to the internet in itself a measure of, or can be a creator of inequality, or, or not having access to the internet? Yeah, of course. So access is a dimension of equality, not in the sense that I think Tocqueville was talking about, but in the, in the sense we usually mean, that is critically important. And, and when you have radically un, uh, different access, you produce a society which is radically unfair. In the United States, you, know, the, the, you can't believe how bad the broadband policy is, but here's a little bit more of just how bad it is. In North Carolina, which is the worst broadband state, some of the local communities recognizing they had the worst broadband of any state in the Union, started building their own networks. Like they just you know, bought access to um, a fiber line and just laid fiber to the homes and started offering 100 megabit service at the same price that France offers it. It was amazing. The local monopolies went to the legislature and got the legislature to pass a law banning communities from providing fast, cheap internet to their citizens, right? And I think the best way to understand what's wrong with that is that you're saying to the North Carolina citizens, you are not allowed to enter the 21st century on the same terms as France. I'm sorry to pick on France so much, I can't resist it after the Sarkozy conference, but as, as the rest of the world. And there's some, there's, that is a deep injustice of inequality in exactly that sense. A access is a minimum. 
But even with pretty crappy access, as most of the Middle East had, they're able to form revolutions, right? So once you get over a minimal point, it gives people the taste of what's, potential, what's possible. And it's that taste which motivates the innovation and reform and revolution of Islam. It's wonderful you want us to help you, but maybe we'd like you to help us. What do you see as our one, two, or three in New Zealand, our top scariest thing that we may get wrong in a year or two? You know, I, I don't think I know enough to say to that a question with the right uh, completely. You know, I would say I was disappointed um, with the embrace of what is essentially the three strikes. Uh, provision, but I was encouraged by the fact that the, you know, the cutoff notice, which is of course part of the three skites architecture, in New Zealand is delayed for at least two years, so you can study whether the more moderate graduated response by ISPs is a better system. Um, and I think the most important thing is that that process of evaluating be honest and have integrity to it. Which again, you know, in the United States, I would say not possible to imagine it honest and with integrity. But here, I think it is possible to imagine it being engaged in with honest integrity. I think you've demonstrated you have the government infrastructure to support that. Again, you might not like the current government, you might not like the last government, but you've got to rise above that a little bit to recognize just what you've got. So I think making that process honest and answering the question honestly about whether this is in fact enough or too much or um, would be Im extraordinarily important. Continuing to push the innovation ne necessary to bring you into the broadband 21st century is also really important. I mean, you know, you, this, this country has enormous potential. You're at the edge of the world. The only way to get away from being at the edge of the world is to actually have fast, cheap access. You know, and the kind of architecture of capped data access is terrible, right? I mean, I, mean, I experienced, yeah, well, I experience it even in you know a high class hotel here. So check in, I turn on my machine, I'm told I have 100 megabits. I don't know what 100 megabits means for internet connectivity. I just check my email. 69 megabits have been used just checking my email, right? So I, and then I started thinking, well, okay, I'm not going to go look at you know this thing on YouTube, and I'm not going to go sitting there uh, and, and surfing in a thousand different ways. I'm going to make all sorts of decisions that restrict the way in which I get access to the network. And also here, of course, your ability to upload to this network has been stifled by the architecture and the way in which it's been deployed. You've got to push towards the sensible position that says we need the same kind of access that Korea and Japan and France and Britain and Germany had. There's no reason New Zealand is different from those countries. Of course, it's going to require one or two new fiber connections to the mainlands. I understand those things are being rolled, but it's more than that. So pushing there. Those are two areas that I think you could make enormous progress if you got. Um, uh, Lawrence, sorry, we're um, out of time for you, but I do have to hear from you now that I've remembered a bit of that. Thank you. And you will be taking part in other sessions throughout the course of the day. So thank you very, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. All right. What a start! What a start to the day. Um,